Thank you. Let me remind you uh, from our first lecture what our aim is which is determine what is new about the new covenant relative to the Davidic covenant according to the Psalter. And our agenda this morning is to sweep through some of the key data in the first three books of the Psalter. Uh, I realized uh, after Thursday evening that those who uh, didn't have the handout were at a significant disadvantage. Um, so I, I trust that um, that is now um, uh, clear that it would be very helpful to um, have access to that during the course of uh, all the lectures that I uh, intend to give. Roman 1, a new covenant agenda for the Psalter set by Psalm 2. It's generally held that the first two Psalms form the gateway into the Psalter. I have elsewhere sketched why and how I believe Psalms 1 and 2 fulfill this function. The Torah meditation referred to in Psalm 1 has as its object the content of Psalm 2. And Psalm 2, in turn, is programmatic for the entire Psalter. It's not critical for our present purposes that my precise understanding of how the first two psalms fit together be followed, only that the importance of the introductory role played by the first two psalms be recognized. Given this key introductory function, if Psalm 2 addresses questions of covenant relationships, such questions cannot be considered peripheral to the design of the book of Psalms. More specifically, if the reading of Psalm 2 that we develop in this lecture is correct, it will need to be acknowledged that pinpointing the newness of the new covenant is an undertaking that this part of scripture invites us to pursue. As you can see in the uh, little table there, uh, Psalm 2 verse 7 contains a clear allusion to a promise made to David. 2 Samuel 7, 14a, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Psalm 2 verse 7, I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. Although the term berit, covenant, itself is absent in both 2 Samuel 7 and Psalm 2, Hulk uh, serves as an approximate substitute in Psalm 2, uh, Yahweh's dynastic promise in 2 Samuel 7 uh, is in the background to the psalm, the promise that David's seed, Zerah, would become a son for Yahweh and that this son's throne would be established forever. And there's a clear consensus on this point. Does this mean that the second psalm presents the perspective of the Davidic covenant? Well, the question of how we should understand the precise connection between 2 Samuel 7 and its evocation here in Psalm 2 is not a major concern of the commentators. But a Davidic covenant outlook does often seem to be assumed, implied, or even stated. Peter Craigie maintains that the psalm sets forth a renewal of the Davidic covenant. Jared Van Groningen sees in the psalm a perpetuation of Yahweh's covenanting act with David. But several considerations point in a different direction, and you have them on the handout first. The interpreter of this psalm is faced with the considerable problem of determining the original historical context. Who is the son of verse 7? David himself? Calvin, Solomon, Kirkpatrick, Josiah, Briggs, every Davidic king, Anderson, Matir. Should we avoid seeking a referent from amongst the kings of Judah, perhaps by virtue of a particular Zitz im Leben, sociological setting, Terian, or an exilic setting, Bullock, or a post-exilic setting, Zenger? or maybe in line with the psalm's prophetic character and or 
in the light of the New Testament, Spurgeon, Williams. Even if the presupposition of an enthronement ceremony continues to be favored by commentators, the psalm alludes to no precise historical circumstance. While the question of authorship is settled by Acts 4, 25-26, the enigma of what time and circumstances David was referring to remains. The question needs to be addressed. Is identifying a royal referent in Israel's history a necessary hermeneutical quest in the case of Psalm 2? Secondly, in this psalm, the promises which immediately follow verse 7 outstrip those of the Davidic covenant. Nowhere else in the various narratives or mentions of the promises to David do we learn that his son will inherit the nations or that he will shatter them like earthenware, verses 8 and 9. Possession and destruction of the nations are promises of a more grandiose order. Louis Jacquet speaks of an exploitation of the dynastic oracle of 2 Samuel 7 such that it has universal scope. As Stephen Dempster puts it, the second psalm stresses the importance of the Davidic kings meditating on Nathan's oracle to David, which now has universal scope. Thirdly, the Psalm 2 king enjoys a status which, again, is of a different order relative to what's envisaged in the passages in Samuel King's Chronicles relating to the Davidic covenant. To be sure, the dynastic oracle can promise a throne that is perpetually established, 2 Samuel 7, verses 13 verses, and 16, and David's reputation is to be likened to the greatest of the earth, 2 Samuel 7, 9. But in Psalm 2, Yahweh, who is in heaven, verse 4, confers on his son a role and rank that correspond to his own. Yahweh's response to the rebellious nations is to assert the kingship of his son, verses 5 and 6. Conspiring against Yahweh and conspiring against his anointed one are not separable concepts, verse 3. Indeed, the nations express their desire to rid themselves of their bonds and their cords, those of Yahweh and his Messiah. Fourthly, we can go further by noting the ambiguity as between Yahweh and his son. Consider Psalm 2, verse 12. Pay homage to the son, or he will be angry, and you will perish in your rebellion. For his anger may ignite at any moment. All those who take refuge in him are happy. Remarkably few commentators discuss this but the referent of the pronouns he, his, and him could be the son, as the first clause of the verse favors, so Calvin, or Yahweh, as the rest of the psalm and the Psalter favor, so Kirkpatrick. We may wish to argue, alongside Peter Craigie, that submission to Yahweh is evinced by means of submission to the king, and therefore that there is ultimately no particular interpretative problem. But my point is not that the ultimate interpretation is difficult, but that the ambiguity is in evidence. And the reason why this is important turns on the proximity that this phenomenon creates with a series of passages in the latter prophets which exhibit the same ambiguity of referent and which speak of an eschatological David in connection with a new covenant. Hosea 3, 5, Micah 2, verses 13 and 14, compare Ezekiel 34, 7 to 31, Zechariah 11, 10, Zechariah 12.10. I spoke on Thursday evening of LV, which is the longer version of the material that I would give you if I had time. And in LV, I give an example at this point, which I'm going to skip over now. Fifthly, a contrast 
with the first expression of the Davidic covenant is suggested by the second half of Psalm 2, verse 6. On Zion, my holy mountain. For 2 Samuel 7 evokes the scenario of David's son committing iniquity and even calls attention to Saul's rebellion in this connection. Whereas Yahweh's anointed in Psalm 2 is established in a holy rule that is inseparable from the temple, so Calvin. Here, Samuel Driver, in the original promise, the possibility of the ruler spoken of sinning is expressly contemplated. In Psalm 2, however, the poet takes the promise of verse 14a absolutely and leaves this possibility out of the question. Sixthly, the final line of Psalm 2, considered in context, requires that the beneficiaries of the decree of verse 7 be plural, which again stands in contrast to the Davidic covenant. The opening word of verse 10, v'ata, serves as a conjunction that draws a conclusion from the preceding content of the psalm concerning the son's kingship. One of these conclusions, featuring right at the end of the psalm, is that those who find refuge in Yahweh or the son are happy, fortunate, privileged, blessed. Whilst it would be mistaken to downplay the solidarity between the king, <coughs> between the king and his subjects, the dynastic oracle of 2 Samuel 7 highlights the king alone as being the object of divine chesed, covenant faithfulness. This democratization of blessing relative to the Davidic covenant has a ready and illuminating new covenant parallel in Isaiah 55, which chronologically stands in the background to the book of Psalms. In verse 3, God promises to make an everlasting covenant. So Isaiah 55, verse 3, God promises to make an everlasting covenant. Continuity with the Davidic covenant is specified in the same verse, my steadfast, sure love for David. But the covenant partner on view is not the singular David, contrast 2 Samuel 23, verse 5, but the plural you, in context, the referent of you, plural, must comprise all who are thirsty, Isaiah 55 verse 1, the servants of Yahweh, in the preceding verse, Isaiah 54, 17, or faithful Israelites. These same people are also the beneficiaries of the covenant, those who enjoy complete, free satisfaction, verses 1 and 2, and abundant pardon, verse Seven. I remember in um, <clears throat> my studies, was it uh, third year or fourth year that we studied Isaiah um, in Hebrew, lots and lots of chapters. And um, This is not in my script, by the way, but um, that really thrilled my heart and continues to uh, Isaiah 55. Um, this is not the Davidic covenant, but the new covenant. Seventhly, we've touched on the globalization on view in the psalm relative to the Davidic covenant in our second consideration. It's possible that 2 Samuel 7 itself testifies to an international scope for the Davidic covenant. Walter Kaiser's influential interpretation of verse 19b uh, could be invoked here. The law of man, uh, he understands as being the charter for humanity, and he has won over a lot of uh, uh, scholars to his point of view or uh, Ralph Davis's reading of 2 Samuel 23, verse 3 could be invoked. Um, ruler over mankind, he understands. These texts are, texts are, though, obscure. It's less controversial to note that the nations are not left behind when Solomon appeals to the Davidic covenant in his prayer at the inauguration of the temple in 1 Kings 8. Yet it seems significant that the blessing for the, na the blessing for the nations is never set forth as a constitutive element of the promises made to David. It is true that aspects of the Abrahamic covenant come to be incorporated in the Davidic covenant, and also that blessing for the nations is a key element of the Abrahamic promises, of course. Uh, 
But these two covenants need to be distinguished. And inasmuch as they come together in this Psalm, Psalm 2, it's not a function of the Davidic covenant, but of the new covenant. The all of Psalm 2, verse 12, certainly encompasses the nations. The reference of the vocatives in verse 10 correspond to the subjects of verses 1 and 2. The call to the nations to find refuge in Yahweh or the Son, Psalm 2, verses 10 to 12, is a new covenant trait, as again Isaiah 55 envisages. So Isaiah 55, verse 5, so you will summon a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you will run to you. Eighthly, if, as is possible though not, in my view, probable, the Septuagint carries the original reading of the verb at the start of Psalm 2, verse 9. The image is one of shepherding, not shattering. In this case, one would be led to note the rapprochement with a, another new covenant come new David passage, namely Micah 5, verses 1 to 4, or verses 2 to 5 um, in English. With or without this image, one is struck by the number of correspondences between Psalm 2 and Micah 5, verse 3, in Hebrew, verse 4 in English. He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of Yahweh, in the majestic name of Yahweh, his God. They will live securely, for then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. To be noted there are the tight connection between Yahweh and the Messiah, the Messiah's universal greatness, and the security of the people. Psalm 2 and Micah 5, both new covenant. Ninthly, the grandiose character of the Psalm 2 king is reinforced by the juxtaposition with Psalm 3. It's not necessary to have a developed view of Psalter arrangement to be struck by the contrast between the Davidic figure of Psalm 2, installed on Zion, Yahweh's holy mountain, and the David of Psalm 3, who is running away from his son Absalom. Uh, to be sure, the holy mountain also features in Psalm 3, uh, though in such a way as to highlight the absence of David and the presence of Yahweh. Here in this third psalm, we are a long way from the scenario of others finding refuge in David, who is lonely and beleaguered, threatened by many enemies. Whilst these observations do not amount to proof of a new covenant outlook in Psalm 2, they do help the Psalter reader correctly to evaluate the figure who is on view in that introductory psalm. The greatness of the Messiah, King, Son of Psalm 2 is not to be underestimated, which is a slightly pompous academic way of saying, Jesus is fantastic. <laughs> In sum, Psalm 2 conveys a new covenant perspective. But the allusion to the Davidic covenant in verse 7 invites the question of how the Davidic and new covenants relate. We can expect this question to be elucidated as the remainder of the Psalter explores the concerns of this programmatic second psalm. What we've seen thus far is that the Davidic seed of 2 Samuel 7 turns out to occupy the same rank as Yahweh himself, that he is a new, holy David who is heir and judge of the uh, nations and the locus of blessing for all, including among non-Jews, who take refuge in him or Yahweh. It seems that under the new covenant, the original promises of the dynastic oracle are, on the one hand, confirmed and encompassed, and on the other, extended and even transcended. Whilst it's clear that the theology of Psalm 2 incorporates the Davidic covenant without being a mere reprise of it, the overall picture that we gain from the data that we've marshaled precludes our asserting that the new covenant represents a modification of the Davidic covenant. The aggregate of the differences between the two covenants in the, in the psalm is simply too great. Commentators of the parallel passage in Isaiah 55 advocate speaking of a change of partner or a change of beneficiary for the Davidic covenant. But our treatment of both passages requires no such hypotheses. 
Rather, we should presume that the Davidic covenant both remains intact and comes to be integrated into the larger schema of the new covenant, as in the diagram. And the evidence points in the same direction for Psalm 2. The new covenant encompasses and transcends the Davidic covenant. Second major heading. New covenant typology is incorporated in the Davidic covenant. And here I'm appealing to Psalms 18, 20, and 21. There's much that could be said about typology from the book of Psalms. I've elsewhere sketched some, some thoughts as to how David serves as both type and reverse type or contrastive type of the Psalm 2 king. For current purposes, we'll need to restrict our inquiry in this area to what is clearly germane to our quest for precision as to the newness of the new covenant. Psalms 18 and 21 are intriguing in this regard and may lead us to reevaluate our understanding of how the Davidic covenant functions. Now, I'd like you to be able to scrutinize my working here, um, so I'm going to ask you to read the next four paragraphs, though not now, um, and I'll take you to the conclusion, but please um, be noble Bereans, check everything, come back to me, tell me it's not convincing, and so forth. Um, so um, the, we'll skip over the four paragraphs, you'll be able to check everything, the full text is there. Uh, and then I'll take you now to the conclusion for this uh, part. This will enable us to um, uh, save a bit of time. So uh, we are now at um, the top of page three. Uh, what we have seen, in your case, by faith, um, <laughs> is that the historical David enjoys some considerable measure of the fulfillment of promises that apply to his son and that ultimately go hand in hand with the realization of the new covenant. This may require that we make some adjustment to our understanding of how the Davidic and new covenants relate. But the perspective of Psalms 18 and 21 chimes in with that of 2 Samuel 7. So 2 Samuel 7, um, selected parts of verses 12 to 16, I will raise up your seed after you and I will establish his kingdom. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. My covenant faithfulness will not depart from him. Your house and your kingdom will be before you forever. Your throne will be established forever. Psalm 18, verse 51, granting great deliverances to his king, showing covenant faithfulness to his Messiah, to David and his seed forever. And Psalm 21, verses five, seven, and eight. You uh, gave him length of days forever and ever, for you have made him a blessing forever, for the king is trusting in Yahweh and in the covenant faithfulness of the Most High. He is not moved. The syntax of Psalm 18, verse 51, uh, in Hebrew 50, in English, highlights the intimate connection between David and his seed as beneficiaries of Yahweh's covenant faithfulness. This idea may feel foreign to us. In the light of 2 Samuel 7, we are not wrong to understand that the promise concerns David's seed and son. But there is a sense in which it concerns David himself too. And verse 16 of the original promise in 2 Samuel 7 does speak of David's house, David's kingdom, David's throne being established before him, before David, during David's lifetime. And so those glimpses of what seem that you haven't seen, but you will see when you read those four paragraphs, of what seemed like new covenant fulfillment in David were not mistaken. Appeal to Psalter context allows us to articulate this in terms of typology. Psalm 19, the central psalm of the concentric structure that I discuss in those four paragraphs as well, um, that juxtaposes the psalms we've been considering, presents David as a model patterned after the righteous man of Psalm 1. 
Other parts of Book 1 and Book 2 show him to be a reverse type, contrastive type. But this part of Book 1 elucidates an aspect of the Davidic covenant that we can now summarize as follows. David is not the Psalm 2 new covenant king, but it is a feature of the Davidic covenant that he should serve as a type of this king. Next heading. Fulfillment of the Davidic covenant entailed by fulfillment of the new covenant. And here I can summarize because it's not difficult. We're in territory that's similar to uh, Psalm 2. Book 2 opens with a crisis whose solution frames the remainder of the book. This solution set forth in Psalms 45 and 72 takes a new covenant form. We see the king's absolute universal supremacy. If you need to check out, read the Psalms later, if they're not familiar to you, please do so. Um, <clears throat> we see the king's absolute universal supremacy. His justice is center stage. The prospect of peace and prosperity, <clears throat> when considered against the background of parallels and the latter prophets, point to a future beyond the exile associated with the coming of the Messiah and the fulfillment of the new covenant. The king is to enjoy the same status as Yahweh himself again. Um, <clears throat> the, the object of fear in perpetuity, possessing renown forever. Uh, the honor and fame conferred upon the king are likened to the duration of the sun and the moon, alluding to passages in Jeremiah that fall within the lengthy exposition of the new covenant that he uh, expands, Jeremiah chapters 30 to 33, into which we'll return. Yet, in these two new covenant psalms, a Davidic covenant outlook is also entailed. This may already be suggested by the fact, uh, which I've defended elsewhere, that both psalms present the king as Solomonic. But we can go further. For Psalm 45, uh, consider how uh, <clears throat> Hebrew verses 3, 7, and 18 uh, echo the dynastic oracle of 2 Samuel 7. Just checking I've given you this. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, Psalm 45, uh, verse 3, or, or 2 in English, uh, you are the most handsome of men. Grace flows from your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Uh, verse 7 or 6 in English, your throne, God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. Um, verse 18 uh, in Hebrew, 17 in English. I will cause your name to be remembered for all generations. Therefore, the peoples will praise you forever and ever. Now compare this with 2 Samuel 7. I will establish his kingdom. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. My covenant faithfulness will not depart from him. Your house and your kingdom will be before you forever. Your throne will be established forever. And regarding some... 72, allusions to the Davidic covenant are not as clear, but it is the son of the king who is on view, verse 1. And as already noted, he is to be feared perpetually and enjoy perpetual renown. What these observations point to is an indissoluble link between the new covenant and the Davidic covenant, stated simply, fulfillment of the new covenant could not be envisaged were it not for God's faithfulness to his promises to David. Roman 4. Fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant entailed by fulfillment of the new covenant. And here we're at uh, Psalm 72, verse 17b. We do well to remind ourselves that this verse constitutes the climactic conclusion to the psalm for verses 18 and 19 form the doxology that concludes book 2 and verse 20 constitutes, so to speak, an editorial footnote. Here then are the closing words of Psalm 72. They will be blessed in him and all nations will call him blessed. 
The allusion to Genesis 12, verse 3, and related texts that, that you have on the handout is clear and uncontroversial. The pronouns him there uh, refer to the king, who corresponds to the new covenant king of Psalm 2. So this king is the locus of the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham. They will be blessed in him. In other words, if blessing for the nations is to be attained, the new covenant must be fulfilled by means of the Messiah of the Davidic covenant. We're reminded of the programmatic Psalm 2. Happy are all who take refuge in him. And we can now be more dogmatic about that latter text referring to the Son uh, rather than to Yahweh. The diagram uh, summarizes the, uh, the point there. Now, I'm, I'm going to skip over quite a lot of material found in LV. Um, but uh, please note the heading at Roman 5. And check out those psalms. Again, like noble Bereans, please, uh, if you have any doubt. Um, and then uh, we're going to move on to uh, number 6. An unconditional covenant broken by God himself, question mark. One of the most clear-cut results of editorial criticism is the recognition that Psalm 89 leaves the unfolding story of the Psalter on a cliffhanger as book three draws to a close. Just uh, useful to note here that the uh, doxology of uh, verse 53 or 52 um, in English uh, serves as the conclusion to book three as a whole rather than the end of its closing psalm. The end of Psalm 89 itself is striking for the intensity of its expression of gloom and perplexity. It's fitting that Psalm 89 is juxtaposed with Psalm 88, the gloomiest psalm in the Psalter, with which it shares some striking lexical links. Patently, the cause of the perplexity is Yahweh's apparent failure to honor his commitments to his Messiah. In uh, verses 39 to 52 or 38 to 51 in English. What seems to be his lack of chesed and emunah, uh, covenant faithfulness and faithfulness, <laughs> or um, truthfulness, or um, loyalty, um, in the shape of his apparent breaking of a covenant, the Davidic covenant, that had been unconditionally and perpetually established according to verses 2 to 38, or 1 to 37 in English. The historical circumstances giving rise to the crisis are those of the Babylonian exile. Check that out later. Indeed, the psalmist places particular stress on this unconditionality, such that his perplexity is rendered all the more acute and poignant the length of the psalm, and it's the third or fourth longest in the Psalter, is in part a reflection of its serving as a vehicle for conveying this stress. Right from the start, the psalmist insists on the unbreakable character of the Davidic covenant. Yahweh's everlasting faithfulness is associated not only with creation, verse 3 or 2 in English, but also with the promise of an everlasting seed and throne for David. Verses 4 and 5, or 3 and 4 in English. The covenant comes in the most solemn form that a word can take, an oath. Later, this swearing of an oath is reinforced by Yahweh's holiness. Verse 36 or 35. And constancy, 
verse 50 or 59. It would be hard to imagine how God's character could be more clearly on the line in what he promises to David. And once again, I implore you to read the psalm if um, this is not sounding familiar. It's unthinkable that Yahweh would prove to be a liar. Should we indulge ourselves? Should I actually read this bit? Um, verse uh, 36 or 35 be in English. Well, let's read the whole verse. Once for all I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. This oath is sworn once and for all. It cannot be revoked. The insistence on the unconditional character of the Davidic covenant is all the more striking against the background of the texts in 1 Kings that bespeak its conditionality. So you have this on the handout. Psalm 89 verses, uh, verses 31 and 32 um, in Hebrew. Uh, if his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they profane my statutes and do not keep my commandments, 1 Kings 2 verse 4, if your sons keep their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and all their soul, 1 Kings 6 verse 12, if you walk in my statutes and perform my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, 1 Kings 8 verse 25, if only your sons keep their way to walk before me as you walked before me, 1 Kings 9 verse 4. If you walk before me as David your father walked to perform according to all that I commanded you, if you keep my statutes and my judgments. Unlike their counterparts in the book of Kings, the conditional clauses in Psalm 89 are expressed negatively. If your sons do not, and accordingly the two verbs that are connoted negatively, forsake, profane, don't feature in the king's texts. But the other two verbs, walk, keep, feature at least once each in each of the four kings passages. Regarding the four nouns that designate the law, three are attested at least once in the four kings passages taken as a whole, including all three together in 1 Kings 6 verse 12. But the key observation is that in context, the conditionality is left to stand in the kings passages, whereas it's ruled out in Psalm 89. Maybe we should just uh, read that so that we're all uh, on board. Uh, so this is English verse 30. If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not remove from him my chesed or be false to my faithfulness. Uh, in 1 Kings 6, verse uh, 12, the declaration, I will fulfill my promise to you, which I made to your father David, is valid only in the event of Solomon's proving to be obedient. Indeed, a binary structure of blessing and cursing will be operating. Israel's fortunes rest on the ability of Solomon and his sons to obey as Yahweh's words following the temple dedication spell out. Here I'm reading from 1 Kings 9, 1 Kings 9, verses 4 to 7. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked with a, a heart of integrity and in what is right, doing everything I've commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and ordinances, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised your father David. You will never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. If you or your sons turn away from following me and do not keep my commands, the, my statutes that I have set before you, and if you go and serve other gods and worship them, I will cut off Israel from the land I gave them and I will reject the temple I have sanctified for my name. Israel will become a, an object of scorn and ridicule among all the peoples. In other words, the Davidic promises may well fail according to 1 Kings. By contrast, according to the perspective of Psalm 89, which you've just read, Nothing can stand in the way of the covenant's inviolable character. Should David's sons prove disobedient, says Yahweh, then 
I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes, but I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. The unconditional character of the promise we find here in Psalm 89 is aligned with the original formulation of 2 Samuel 7, 14b to 15. At first sight, the perspectives of 1 Kings and Psalm 89 appear to be contradictory. Before the conclusion of our study, we will have occasion to appreciate how and why contradiction is not the right category, as our inerrantist instincts drive us to believe in the first place. The uh, conditional and unconditional dimensions of the Davidic covenant prove to be readily reconcilable. At this stage, however, of the unfolding flow of the Psalter, we do well to let the tension stand. I fear that in some proposals for harmonizing the conditionality with the unconditionality for this covenant, this difficulty may be resolved artificially or prematurely, such that tension is alleviated at too early a stage in redemptive history. Ralph Davis, commenting on the uh, 1 Kings 2 passages relationship with 2 Samuel 7, suggests that, quote, the unfaithfulness or disobedience of Solomon or of any Davidic king would not negate the promise to David, but there will be no enjoyment of the blessedness of that promise unless a king remains faithful. Similar proposals abound, yet it seems that what's at issue when the conditionality comes into play is the presence or absence of a Davidic king on the throne according to the terms of the promises made to David. In other words, the stakes are high. Such high stakes are reflected in Psalm 89. Here, uh, Schreiner, what bothers the psalmist in Psalm 89 is that the promises made to David seem to be withdrawn. Next heading, the Messiah of the New Covenant is set forth within the framework of the Davidic Covenant, Psalm 89. An additional dynamic is at work in Psalm 89 that again highlights the unbreakable nature of the Davidic Covenant. The close connection between the Davidic Covenant and the New Covenant that we explored in relation to Psalms 18 and 20 and 21, that you will have explored after you've read those four paragraphs, is clearly on view. Uh, so we've got the same phenomenon here. By way of reminder, or <laughs> a, yeah, um, we saw, or would have seen, in relation to those book one Psalms, that the historical David enjoys some considerable measure of the fulfillment of promises that apply to his son, and that ultimately go hand in hand with the realization of the new covenant. And this is also uh, what we see in Psalm 89. Um, do you know I'm tempted to cover this material? I think, we've, I think we might be able to cover it. Um, I've got it all kind of um, put in brackets and that sort of thing. Um, but let's, let's, let's go over this. So, let's, uh, so consider the comparison between the permanence of creation and that of the Davidic covenant. The uh, Davidic covenant is established forever like the days of the heavens, verse 30 uh, in Hebrew, uh, like the sun, verse 37, like the moon, verse 38. Here is the, here is the new covenant language, which we already touched on, of Jeremiah 31 and 33 and Psalm 72. Secondly, as in Psalm 2, which portrays the Messiah of the new covenant, I'm quoting a um, certain Jean-Bernard Dumortier here, the regal power is the exact reflection of the divine power. The king is therefore not Yahweh's vassal, but the one who acts in Yahweh's very stead, his stand-in. Yet, as in the case of Psalm 18, the framework of this new covenant outlook is explicitly that of the Davidic covenant. As you can check up uh, in the psalm, do we need to... Uh, do, we, do we need to see that together, that this is a Davidic covenant uh, outlook that is presented here? Um, verses 3 and 4 in Hebrew, that'll be um, 2 and 3 um, in English. Uh, 
Um, for I said, steadfast love will be built up forever in the heavens. You will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have chosen, I've made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. And you can also check out verse 29. That'll be 28 in English to so the 36 or 35 and 50 or 49. Specifically, just as in Psalm 18, David stands at the head of the nations within the framework of the Davidic covenant, so here, according to the promise of Psalm 89, he will be ranked more highly than the kings of the earth. That's verse 28 or verse 27 in English. Terms that would normally be reserved for Yahweh himself are applied to the earthly king David. Most high, shield of Israel. It's telling that the distinguished systematician Henri Blochet can wonder whether verse 28 doesn't attribute the terms firstborn and most high to the new David. That would be verse 27 um, in English. His exegetical reason for leaning in, in this direction is that... Um, Hebrew verse 27a, 26a in English, um, harks back to 2 Samuel 7, 14, which speaks of David's son. But one needs to allow the shock to be felt. Such exalted titles are conferred upon the earthly monarch, the referent not changing between Hebrew verse 21, David, and Hebrew verse 27. Indeed, the focus in this psalm is very much on David himself. Whereas in 2 Samuel 7, verses 13 to 15, there is an individual offspring designated by the use of singular personal pronouns who benefits from Yahweh's chesed, the closest equivalent individual in Psalm 89 is David himself. To be sure, a reference to David's seed does emerge. Hebrew verse 30, that'll be English verse 29. Um, but it's developed as a collective by means of the plural nouns, his sons, and pronouns that feature in the ensuing verses 31 to 33 in Hebrew. Once these plurals revert in Hebrew verse 34 to the singular in speaking of the unshakable chesed, it appears that it's David who is again on view. I will not violate my chesed towards him. Does, of course, echo the dynastic promise of 2 Samuel 7, 15. My chesed will not leave him. But whereas the original's oracle, original oracle's reference is the seed or son of David, the reference in Psalm 89 is probably David, in keeping with the fact that the chesed of this covenant invariably refers to David, as opposed to his offspring elsewhere, elsewhere in this psalm. In short, according to the perspective of Psalm 89, the partner of the Davidic covenant, that is David, son of Jesse, bears close resemblance to the new covenant figure who is his seed and son. Rhetorically, this heightens the sense of crisis at the close of book three as the psalmist laments the apparent collapse of the Davidic covenant. With the advent of the exile, it appears that the remedy, the coming of the new covenant king, is in doubt. Theologically, it one, reinforces our observations from book one regarding the typological dimension of the Davidic covenant, its function of setting forth David as a type of the new covenant king, and two, enables us to appreciate the tightness of connection between the Davidic and new covenants. The Sinaitic conditionality and Roman 8 is flagged elsewhere in book 3. If conditionality is excluded from the Davidic covenant perspective of Psalm 89, it does feature elsewhere in book 3. The Sinaitic dynamic of disobedience to the Mosaic law giving rise, rise to covenant curses is clearly on view in Psalm 78. And the sheer length of Psalm 78, it is the second longest of the Psalter, means that it receives peculiar emphasis. Its introduction serves to warn the people of the dangers of failing to keep the commandments of the Torah, verses 1 to 8. The lesson to be heeded concerns the sons of Ephraim, who 
did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law, verses 9 and 10. As a result, God rejected the tent of Joseph and didn't choose the tribe of Ephraim, verse 67. But there are other important strands in the psalm. God's patience and grace are highlighted, as is the choice of the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved, and of David, his servant, uh, at the end of the psalm. From the perspective of Psalm 89, the choice of David, which constitutes the climax of this Psalm 78, no doubt renders the Babylonian exile all the more calamitous. Yet Psalm 78 does provide the theological ammunition that accounts for that exile, namely the seriousness of covenant unfaithfulness on the human side. Psalm 78, verse 37. And in particular, the Israelites' failure to comply with the conditions of the Mosaic Covenant. Compare Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. Psalm 81 clearly indicts the people for precisely such failure. God had appeared at Mount Sinai in the secret place of thunder. That's verse 8 or verse 7 in English, recalling Exodus 19 and 20, and had established a covenant with the people that can be summarized by verses 10 and 11, or verses 9 and 10 in English. There must not be a strange God among you. You must not bow down to a foreign God. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But immediately afterwards, we learn that this is how the Israelites signally failed to live. Verses 12 to 14, or verses 11 to 13 in English. They failed to heed God's voice, the verb, the verb uh, shama features twice, proving to be unsubmissive and stubborn and following their own devices and paths. The verb, the verb, verb is the word in English. Um, halak uh, features twice. Uh, according to the terms of this covenant, a blessing is contingent upon obedience. Verses 14 to 17 or 13 to 16 in English. Last heading, New Covenant Fulfillment as the Framework for Fulfillment of the Abrahamic Covenant. As we have argued elsewhere, it's our contention that Book 3 does provide a glimpse of the solution, notably in the four Psalms that follow the Asaf group and precede the outer frame, that's Psalms 84 to 87. These Psalm Psalms paint positive pictures of the temple, Psalm 84, the land, Psalm 85, a servant of Yahweh who expresses confidence in God's chesed, Psalm 86, and the city of Zion, Psalm 87. And it appears that they foreshadow the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant within the framework of the new covenant. Most clearly within this group, in Psalm 87, people from a diverse range of nations enjoy the knowledge of Yahweh. That's a new covenant privilege. Jeremiah 31, verse 34, Hosea 2, 22 in Hebrew. Here is the blessing of all nations promised to Abraham, and it's cast in, in a striking mold. Non-Israelites who are citizens of Zion. Peter Orr from Brexiting Northern Ireland, <laughs> born in Zion. James Heaney Hutchinson from non-Brexiting Republic of Ireland, born in Zion. I can shake hands. <laughs> Again, the previous psalm, uh, this is Psalm 86, envisages that all nations will come and bow down before God and honor his name. And we should note that a prominent feature of uh, this psalm, Psalm 86, uh, is its recalling of Exodus 34. We'll be elaborating much more on this uh, when, we, when we come to book four uh, tomorrow, God willing. Um, but uh, verses 5 and 15 of Psalm uh, 86 uh, 
what a, what a what, this wonderful news. We don't have to talk about different versification as between English and Hebrew for this psalm. Um, <laughs> uh, so verses 5 and 15 um, recall Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. I'll just remind you of those verses. Yahweh, Yahweh is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and rich in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving wrongdoing, rebellion and sin. And then uh, in verse 5 of the psalm, for you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive, rich in faithful love to all who call upon you. Using the Holman translation here. Um, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, verse 15, slow to anger and rich in faithful love and, and truth. This is significant because this passage in Exodus 34 reflects the Abrahamic covenant. In context, the grace that Yahweh manifests at the time of the golden calf incident is explicitly rooted in the promises to Abraham, Exodus 32, verses 11 to 14. It's true that the continuation of uh, Exodus 34, verse 7, which speaks of punishment, recalls the Sinaitic covenant. But this part is not cited by the psalmist. Further, if blessing in that Sinai context is set forth as being conditional upon loving Yahweh and keeping his commandments, Exodus 20, verse 6, such is not the case in Exodus 34. And the psalmist specifies that it is those who call on Yahweh who benefit from his chesed, verse 5. One additional datum points in a new covenant direction. The affirmation that Yahweh is kind or good, tov, departs from Exodus 34 language, but is a key term in the New Covenant formula, which plays an important role in Book 5. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is tov. The other two Psalms, 84 and 85, don't portray as clearly as Psalms 86 and 87 the prospect of Abrahamic covenant fulfillment within the framework of New Covenant fulfillment, but their theology does seem to be cut from the same cloth. Those who are happy draw their strength from Yahweh, um, Psalm 84, verse 6 or 5 in English, and trust in him, Psalm 84, verse 13 or verse 12 in English. Assuredly, his salvation is near to those who fear him, Psalm 85, verse 10 or 9 in English. In other words, blessing is bestowed not on the basis of ethnicity, but on the basis of faith in Yahweh. Why did we have to have so much information this morning? Because reductionism is the enemy of good biblical theology. If you're sitting there thinking, I'm completely lost, I didn't take anything in, good news for you, all you need to do, again, you just have to have the hand up, all you need to do is to reread the titles. The titles provide the key take-home points Well, the good news is we have some uh, good time for questions. I think we might just give uh, James uh, a moment to catch his breath. And in that moment, why don't you just take, take a moment uh, with your neighbor and uh, discuss any questions that you might have. And that will hopefully get your juices flowing. So there'll be uh, some good questions for James when we come back together in just a moment. <laughs> Let's uh, draw back together. Uh, so uh, uh, just so that... Uh, as many people get a chance to uh, ask a question. Uh, if you do have a question, please raise your hand, and then I'll uh, indicate for the roving microphones to be uh, brought to you. Uh, please keep your questions as, as concise as you can, and uh, we'll hopefully get through as uh, many questions as possible. And remember that if you'd rather write down a question and put it in the box, uh, those uh, will hopefully be answered uh, first thing tomorrow morning. So, do we have any questions? Yes, Gerald over there. Uh, James, thanks very much. That's a very good presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the composition of the Psalter, uh, you know, the way it's put together, because that's obviously key to what you're arguing. Um, do we know 
anything about that. I mean, who, who, presumably it's not the authors of the, the actual Psalms, but the compilers who would have put it together in, in the order that they are in. Um, and do we have evidence from ancient times of commentators on the Psalter uh, who thought in this way, uh, that it was a, a, you know, a, a single um, composite text pointing in, a, in, in this covenant direction? Uh, I mean, is, uh, what, what evidence is there, if any, uh, of this? Or is this a, a modern construction? Re Thank you, uh, Gerald, very much. Um, with regard to your first comment, um, paradoxically, um, sort of shape is not that key for what I'm wanting to uh, put forward. Um, I'm wanting to build on it to a certain extent, but I'm, I'm, I'm leaning only on what I believe to be clear and uncontroversial and pretty much standard uh, consensus. That's, that's the first uh, uh, important point. Uh, Stephen Jenkins is the man to whom I owe a great deal uh, to answer your second question. And I came to the first lecture armed with his material, ready to read it out uh, for the eventuality that that question be posed, because it, I, I read out a list of, of names from the uh, early church people who had already uh, come to take sort of shape to some extent seriously, and I was ready to provide all of that. It is actually sitting in that um, backpack over there, and I could probably fish it out. I, my, I, it might not be, actually. Um, but I can certainly provide it, but probably for the start of, of next, next time. Uh, that that might, might be a little bit more productive. Um, but yes, yeah, so the, the, um, what, I, what I suggested in the, in the first lecture was that, uh, yes, it's true that until the last 30, 40 years, it's not something that um, previous generations in, in the recent past have majored on. But go back a bit further and and they have, not to the same extent as today, um, but uh, the idea that there are uh, five books, I don't think that's ever been particularly called into question. Um, and then for a lot of these data, um, one's simply reading what's there. So you're, you're simply, someone like Calvin, who, who wasn't interested um, particularly in, in this question, does nonetheless comment on the fact that the last five Psalms begin and end hallelujah. Um, and even the skeptics of today, um, John Golden Gay and uh, Tremper Longman would be the two key uh, evangelical skeptics. Even they are only skeptics to a limited extent. It's all a question of where you want to put yourself on the spectrum. Um, so with regard to tomorrow, um, uh, John Golden Gay is happy to describe book four as the Moses book. Um, and I'm not saying an awful lot more than that. <laughs> so... Um, I understand that it can be disconcerting uh, to think, oh, goodness, are we building a, a, a massive uh, construction on, on, a, on, a, on a shaky foundation? But I, I, don't, I don't think we are. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Healy Hutchinson. Uh, this is a gross caricature of your argument, so please forgive me the oversimplification, but it sounds to me that when you go looking for new covenant themes, you can find a lot of evidence in the Psalter. I guess my question is, does your argument require a developed notion of a strong new covenant theology and theme at the time the Psalter was being compiled? And if so, where does that Old Testament ex set of expectations about the new covenant come from? Um, again, in, in, the, in the first lecture, I started to, to outline some, some answers to that. Um, one of the, um, the, the key uh, reasons for believing that we are in the presence of new covenant theology, particularly in books four and five, is the uh, refrain of book five, uh, give thanks to Yahweh for he is good, for his chesed uh, endures forever. When you study the base text for that, which is Jeremiah 33, 11, you are in new covenant territory. Now, Jeremiah precedes uh, 
chronologically and canonically the final form of the Book of Psalms. So you're invited to see in... Uh, it happens, I've, I've written an article on, on that expression, all the occurrences of that expression as it comes, uh, not only in Jeremiah, but also in Ezra and the... Um, in, in Chronicles and in the Psalms, and I, and I, and I argue, and I believe, um, I'm absolutely persuaded that it, it, it uh, connotes a New Covenant all the way through. It's, a, it's an Old Testament, exclusively Old Testament uh, slogan, if you like, but it, it is connoted New Covenant. So that, that's, a, that's a good enough reason in itself. Um, uh, uh, if... Um, We can then uh, say, uh, are, you, are you giving me permission to turn to the New Testament uh, in, in our reading of the Psalter at this point or not? Not. Okay. <laughs> I refer you to the, at this stage, I refer you to the, to the other points in the first lecture, that, and, and then you can, you can wait and see, because, because at this point, um, the uh, New Covenant answer to the psalmist's perplexity has not been unfolded. So just wait and see in books four and five whether you're convinced by the uh, data that I, I put forth. Um, but it's true that I did discuss that today because I believe the introduction does. Psalm two, uh, I believe, uh, is not setting forth a simple Davidic covenant outlook. Um, I'd be interested to know, were you convinced I, I provided nine reasons why I believe that simply stating that it's uh, a, a, a Divinity Covenant outlook is, is unpersuasive. Will you, is, is, does that not uh, cut the mustard for you? <laughs> um, being put on the spot, I, yeah, I found, found it quite persuasive, yeah. <laughs> that was quite persuasive. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Zach. I will. Thanks very much. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about the dating of uh, the Psalms? We've sort of got into it a little bit then. Obviously, David was long dead by the time Jeremiah and Isaiah were. Uh, doing their thing. Um, is that important? Does that matter? How long between psalms being written and psalms being collected? Just some, a, a few uh, key points of, of dating I'd, I'd love to know. Yeah. Sure. Well, there are, um, there are psalms that go, um, go all the way to uh, Moses, Psalm 90. About half of them are produced by, uh, uh, written by David, um, and lots of others by people appointed by him as temple musicians. Uh, and then there are, um, you move on through redemptive history, and there are some that are clearly um, post-exilic. And a good example here would be uh, Psalm 137. Uh, so, um, by the waters of Babylon, uh, sham, there, uh, we, I can't quote it. I can't quote anything in any language these days. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, by the waters of um, uh, Babylon, uh, th there we um, uh, sat down and, and wept, and then the sham comes back uh, again in, in verse uh, 3. Clearly, they are no longer sham. They're back here in Jerusalem. So, the, the, uh, the time of the exile is, is over. 126 would be another example, Psalm 102, uh, 85. So, that there are a, a number of uh, post-exilic psalms, and that then... Tied back to Gerald's question, what about the compilation, the sort of aspect of Gerald's question that I didn't answer? Um, and we, we, do, we don't know who, we don't know who uh, the ultimate uh, compiler, redactor was. There are people who speculated that Ezra might have been, and, and that does fit the data of uh, Ezra 7. But um, it, it, uh, there are good reasons to believe uh, that it predates uh, the... Uh, final form of uh, the book of Chronicles uh, because um, the closing doxology of book 4 that's uh, at the end of Psalm 106 uh, is quoted in 1 Chronicles 16 
Uh, and there are good reasons to believe that the close relationship between the Closing Doxology Book 4 and the Closing Doxology Book 5 suggests that that, 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 that reflects final form of the Psalter. Um, and so, uh, if that's right, I've argued for that, if you want to go into more detail, um, the article that was on the handout from the first, um, uh, the, the, the first session, um, which uh, is in a book published by, uh, a book uh, edited by uh, Wilson and Grant uh, called The God of Covenant, uh, does give some, some more on, on that. Um, so that means that uh, the final form of the Book of Psalms, if that's, uh, if that's correct, uh, is uh, pre something like 390, if you could give that as the terminus ad quem for Chronicles, uh, and then significantly before uh, the Septuagint. There are people, there are even evangelical scholars who argue on the basis of Qumran evidence for a final form of the Book of Psalms that is even um, uh, AD. Um, but as Roger Beckwith and others have argued, um, whatever the uh, Qumran community got up to is a matter for, for them and probably doesn't reflect uh, mainstream. Working? Hello? Uh, my question is a general question about the Psalms. Many Jews today and politicians claim they are right of the land because the Bible says so, and many Christians as well supporting that idea. Are there many Psalms that actually commented on that issues and how they claim from that? So the, the issue of the land, yeah. So right what uh, contemporary relevance in Middle Eastern politics does, does the Psalter play on the question of the land? And I mean, you've, you touched on that at first night about yeah. the, the sort of ongoing relevance for Israel. Anything you want to add? Yeah, I'd, I'd encourage you to, uh, to keep having me back, and particularly on, on Friday morning when we'll, we'll come to evaluate the, uh, the, the various models. Um, uh, a, a, a classical dispensationalist would give you a different answer from uh, others uh, of the um, uh, outlooks on covenant relationships that we discussed on, on Thursday evening. Um, and so uh, I'm, I, I'd have to ask them uh, how they do their exegesis and so forth. Um, I don't often read dispensational uh, commentaries on particular psalms, but um, Psalm 85 would be one uh, where you could, you could consult uh, a dispensationalist uh, come to see how, whether they argue on the basis of that for an, an ongoing validity of uh, the land uh, for Jews today. But perhaps, perhaps a wider question than, than sort of the, the, the Psalms itself would, uh, would deal with. Yeah. Any other questions? Jordan. Thanks very much, Dr. Healy Hutchinson. I'm just wondering, um, Book 5, Psalm 119, makes a lot of the law. Um, what is the connection between the law in the Sinaitic and Deuteronomic Covenant and, and the New Covenant? And do you think Brian Rosner is on the money? <laughs> That's an excellent question, which uh, is germane to what we'll be covering uh, in the first half of our session on Friday morning. Um, and feel free to come back to me on that precise uh, Rosner dimension to the question uh, when the time comes. <laughs> James, could I jump in uh, with, a, with a question that is uh, slightly derivative of what you've been saying, but again, uh, you've stressed that the, the, your, your understanding of the overall structure, y y your, um, your main argument does not stand or fall too heavily on that. C could you say something about the fact that we have this uh, highly edited overall structure of the Psalter, and yet we have remaining those historical indicators of, of um, when a particular psalm was first composed and what is the relationship between those, those historical indications and, and the overall uh, structure of the Psalter? And do you think those historical um, 
references at the beginning are original, to keep that term quite vague. Um, certainly, um, yeah, biblical, um, recognized as such by Psalm 110. Um, as it, so it's by by um, the, the Lord Jesus as he comments on uh, Psalm 110 in, in um, Mark 12. Um, yes, so uh, uh, there are a lot of Psalms where we have no idea of historical circumstances and a lot where we have a very good idea. Um, so in books uh, one and two, and particularly book two, there are a lot of, um, you might want to have um, Bibles open and just flick through with me um, from um, Psalm 51 onwards, uh, we're able to, to pinpoint um, 51, uh, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he'd gone to Bathsheba, 52, um, uh, when Doeg the Edomite uh, came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech, um, uh, 54, um, uh, when the Ziphites went and told Saul, is not David hiding among us, uh, and so on. There's quite, quite a number, particularly uh, in book two. Um, and uh, I take it that this concentration of headings that, that key you in to particular historical moments uh, in David's life chime in precisely with the uh, editorial comment that we find at the end of book two, here ends the prayers of David, son of Jesse. This will become more important as we go on through because we'll be seeing, well, what then do we do with the David Psalms that come after uh, Psalm 72, verse uh, 20. But I take those to be absolutely clear uh, historical uh, indicators. Uh, we know that they don't follow the chronology in uh, 2 Samuel, um, and that, that, is a, that is a clue. The way I've presented this uh, material in the past is to say uh, that, that I think that book two uh, highlights uh, in a greater way than book one the gap between David, son of Jesse, and the Psalm 2 king, the, the, the new covenant, may I call him the new covenant king? Um, uh, the, um, the, the one who's, who's presented, Yahweh's anointed in, in, in Psalm 2. Um, and that indeed, uh, if, you, if you're attentive to um, the, the order of the Psalms, that, that sort of um, conclusion can be drawn. So that Psalm 51 is the first uh, David psalm of book two, and it draws attention to his adultery and his murder, uh, and, and, it, and it hits you. Uh, the, the last David psalm, when you, rec when you understand that Psalms uh, 70 and 71 uh, are combined, um, uh, speaks of David's old age. So here we are at the end of David's life. I think that is not just fortuitous. I think this is part of the, the design of the, uh, of the book of Psalms, uh, and therefore that you can consider Psalm 72 to be his final prayer for his, uh, his son, uh, Solomon. Um, so uh, the concentration of these headings that, that key you into historical moments in books one and two chimes in with what we're told in an editorial comment uh, that these psalms speak of David, son of Jesse. There is one uh, psalm, 142, that also contains a uh, piece of historical information that might look like uh, an exception. Um, but for reasons that I think I'm intending to cover with you, but I certainly have a lot of material on, um, is not an exception. You might want to ponder. You might want to allow that to irritate you over the next... Uh, a few days. Why is the heading of Psalm 142, a masculine of David, when he was in the cave, a prayer, uh, not an exception to the rule I've just given you that the, um, the headings that speak of the historical David, son of Jesse, are found in books one and two? Question here, uh, Peter. Sorry, yep. 
Uh, we were looking through Psalm 51 in class um, last week or the week before, and the question was raised about the building up of the walls in verse 18, uh, and some suggested that that's an exilic reference, and that Ludavid doesn't mean David wrote it, but that it's about David. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on that. What were the arguments in favour of an exilic? Um, so this would be the, just those two verses being um, tacked on the end by a another uh, a long time after David wrote the rest, or that the whole thing might have been. Well, it was. It came under the ambiguity of what Ludavid means. Is it by David, of David, about David? Um, and they pointed to this verse. Um, Oh, sorry, this verse was suggested as evidence that maybe this was written, uh, you know, after the walls of Jerusalem had been torn down, um, and they were um, appropriating David um, as an act of repentance. Mm. Um, mm. I wasn't convinced, but I would love to know, <laughs> I would love to know if you're convinced, and if not, why not? What did, what did Andrew Sheed think? <laughs> It wasn't actually Andrew. Oh. Um, so, um, what yeah. does he think? <laughs> Do you want the mic, Andrew? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. So the, the, uh, I, I can see the, the, the force of the argument. Do good design uh, in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem might, Im, might imply that the, the walls are not uh, standing. Um, is, that, is that necessary? Um, what I can comment on is that um, Le David, uh, there, are, there are very good reasons to uh, suppo presuppose that Le David does imply uh, authorship by David, um, unless there are um, good counter arguments. So it's necessary in Psalm 7. You just read the, the title. It's necessary in Psalm 18. Just read the title. Check it out. Um, and um, I've already commented on Psalm 72, verse 20, um, the prayers of David, son of Jesse. That does seem to suggest that up to that point, that's, that should be taken seriously. Uh, Psalm 110, um, we uh, are told that in, that could create for that could create some problems, given that it. It falls after Psalm 32, verse 20. We can come back to that. Uh, but we know from uh, Mark 12 that that is authored by uh, David. Uh, so I think uh, one needs to have uh, good reasons to, uh, uh, to doubt that. Um, the, it's always possible, is it not, in the same way as you find in uh, the book of Isaiah, for an author to be uh, moved by the Holy Spirit to Peter 1.21 uh, to speak prophetically ahead of, ahead of his time. Um, if you believe, as I do, that uh, Isaiah uh, wrote, Isaiah son of Amos wrote the whole of the 66 uh, chapters of, uh, of the book of Isaiah in the 8th century, uh, then you understand that he is moved by the Holy Spirit to, um, sorry, I've got French expressions coming to my mind, uh, to um, move into the skin of people in the exile uh, in order uh, and to, to anticipate um, uh, a post-exilic scenario. Um, and and that, um, that could be a, an explanation here, but I'd, ha I'd have to look further into that. I think we've got time for one uh, last question. Rob Bryan. Uh, Dr. Healy Hutchinson, your fourth heading that states the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant is entailed by the fulfillment of the new covenant seems to presuppose understanding those covenants as distinct entities. Is there anything from the first three books of the Psalter that would preclude understanding this as simply one covenant progressively being revealed? Uh, in, the, in the Psalter itself, the difficulty with that question is that you can't really conceive of the book of Psalms independently of prior scriptural revelation. Um, how do, you, how do you look at verse, how do you read verse 7? Um, do you want to read verse 7 independently of 2 Samuel 7 verse 14 uh, in, in Psalm 2? So um, I, I find it difficult, a difficult question to, 
to deal with. Are, are, are we meant, so here we are in the writings. This is the first book of the writings. Uh, we've, we've got Pentateuch, former prophets, latter prophets, all preceding uh, the book of Psalms. And you're asking me to, um, again, I've got French expressions going to my head, to ev evacuate um, from my mind um, that preceding revelation. Do I, do I read you correctly? I think in the light of Thursday night, I'm just wondering, would um, a Westminster covenantal thinker simply read your argument and say, well, there's just one covenant being progressively revealed and that there's not one being fulfilled through the fulfillment of another, but simply one being fulfilled? Uh, that might be... That's a very good question. I, I, I now understand more where, where you're coming from. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to think about that. It's possible. It's possible um, that that then would depend on particular readings of the, again, the, 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 the covenants that have been revealed previously. Um, so one of my points being this morning that the Davidic covenant never presents blessing for the nations as a constitutive element of, uh, of, of its, it, 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 its features. So uh, if then um, you're wanting to argue that it does, uh, which is what, you would, what a Westminster covenantalist would, would need to be able to say, uh, then they're going to have to go back and argue it from earlier scriptural revelation, it seems to me. Uh, James, thank you very much. Please uh, join with me in... Uh...